know, I think historians are going to look back on this uh, first quarter of the 21st century and and call it the age of the selfie. And uh, I don't think there's much question about that. And the uh, selfie disease is spreading everywhere. As a matter of fact, just a few days ago, uh, we landed a rover on Mars. And of course, the first thing the rover did on the way down was shoot a selfie. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Bill Little here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and this is your right angle on the landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars, which is an astonishing engineering feat, even more impressive than uh, what happened on a relatively similar scale last time with uh, Curiosity, but it's down safely on Mars, and this time it took pictures the whole way. Now, it's important to stress that what you're about to see was not seen at Mission Control. All this imagery came later. They didn't know what was happening. They're reading it out, which is synced up with the pictures in this, but they weren't seeing any of this at Mission Control. And furthermore, not only could Mission Control uh, not see what was happening as the rover was on its way down to Mars, as Mission Control was calling these things out, Perseverance was already on Mars, whether it was on Mars in one piece or 10,000, Remain to be seen. But before we talk about uh, this stuff, folks, I thought I'd give this to you all of it. It's three and a half minutes. Nice thing about being online is if you've already seen it, just go ahead and fast forward through it. But if you haven't, watching it in real time is really, really worth the trouble. So here's what uh, Perseverance saw on its way down in the selfie it took as it landed on the surface of another world. We are starting to straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate in the cage, shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converge. Velocity solution, 3.3 meters per second. Altitude, 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers above the surface. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life.
Steve, when I saw that parachute come out, uh, two things occurred to me. Number one, that blue sky is a blue sky on another planet. And number two, that parachute is moving supersonically. Right. That is a supersonic parachute deployment from another planet. And it, everything was captured just beautifully. It's a very difficult, incredibly complex thing that they needed to do here. Uh, you know, it's so easy to see, oh, America's really in decline and our schools are so bad and all the rest of it. But nobody in the world could do anything like this. And and when you see the end of it, it's like everybody in Mission Control look like they're like 11 or 12 or something. <laughs> There's an <laughs> astonishing, astonishing <laughs> achievement technologically. And for the first time ever, I think, really, well, certainly for the first time ever, this was the first time any any probe has ever seen itself, recorded itself on the way down. But I think it goes an awful long way to show people just how damn difficult this actually is. This isn't a computer simulation, which everybody just knows. This is the real deal. Real pictures of landing on another world in a very complex fashion. It came off just like a charm. This is a video that I have waited, Bill, literally all my life to see. This is, this is no exaggeration. I was about uh, two months old. When Neil Armstrong took that that one small step for a man. Uh, so I have never known a world that did not have moon landings in it. Um, I was in middle school when we started launching space shuttles on such a regular basis that it became a routine. People tuned it out. Uh, one of my first memories of the space program after Apollo were the uh, the, the Viking landers on on Mars, which were incredible achievements for the for the mid seventies, I followed uh, I fo followed Voyager and Voyager two. In fact, <laughs> here we are, forty years later, more than forty years later, I'm still following Voyager and Voyager two as they are now in interstellar space, the first man made objects ever to do that. But we've never seen anything land ever. We've never seen a landing on an other body before. This blew me away, the, not just the technical achievement, which, as you saw in that clip, is remarkable. The concept is stunning. The execution takes your breath away. But to be able to see it in almost real time, to see it just a couple of days later, I have waited for this like I cannot tell you. I'm trying to tell you and words fail me. I've waited so long to see anything like this. The fact that NASA pulled this off just shows me how good they are when they've got the right mission and the right budget, and they're not bossed around by Congress to build some stupid giant one-use rocket that nobody can afford to launch. Um, this, this is NASA at its very best. This is America at our very best. And we're going to see a lot more like this over the next 20 years. I, I, I can't wait. You know, it's interesting you say that, Steve, because um, not only did um, did uh, Perseverance take its own picture on the way down, uh, there was also a drive-by photo of Perseverance and a similar one for Curiosity several years ago when it made more or less the same kind of landing. In both cases, an American uh, uh, probe orbiting the planet Mars, a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, orbiter managed to be looking in the right place at the right time, which, folks, is not an accident. That is an exceedingly <laughs> difficult thing to do. <laughs> But both with the Curiosity Lander and this time with Perseverance, as you can see here, we managed to have a photograph of the probe under parachutes as it's landing on another planet. So not only did we land a probe on another planet, we took a picture of it from orbit as it was happening. Absolutely ast astonishing. Scott, you know, I'm, I was watching this uh, video several times, and I think the thing that, strangely enough, really affected me the most was the fact that when it started to kick up dust on Mars, it, it, there was something, it became real. It was like, okay, this is like, this is real terrain. It's not just a picture. But the way the dust behaves, you can tell that this is not, this is not the Earth. This, the atmospheric pressure on Mars is less than 1% of the surface on the Earth. So you're getting a little dust, but it looks a lot more like the moon dust in terms of being more like water. And it's just otherworldly. And then finally, uh, Scott, one of the reasons you realize that this thing is so complex in terms of lowering this thing down is that even lowered at the end of this long tethers, the rover is completely, completely enveloped in dust. And if they had taken that thing all the way down without lowering it, there's a good chance they would have buried so much of it underneath dust that it would have been essentially useless. 
You know, the, I, the first time I experienced this landing, um, as they used to say, I saw it on the radio. Um, I actually was, <laughs> I was watching video, but really all I saw was this nice young woman who was describing, and you hear her voice on this video clip, mm -hmm. who was describing what was happening. So in my mind, everything's happening. I'd seen the computer animations beforehand. I'm like, okay, now I see that the heat shield is gone and the parachute's deploying and all of that is playing out of my head. It was so exciting to see the video synced up with what she had said and to see that it happened just as they designed it and said that it was going to happen. Um, one of the things that, it, that I came away from this uh, understanding that I didn't really understand beforehand was this just incredible idea of how to accomplish this at a distance like that. And when I turned on the video feed and I was watching on my computer, they said, uh, we're about an hour and a half from uh, landing. The, uh, the ship is about uh, 9,000 miles away from Mars right now. I'm like, wait a minute. You're 9,000 miles away, and in an hour and a half, you're going to be on the surface? <laughs> How is that even possible? And then after a little while, they go, um, I forget what they called it, but they're like, uh, now, at this point, we're cutting off communication. Uh, we'll just hear like a little heartbeat from the from the uh, craft uh, because we can't control what it does from here on out. And um, it is uh, programmed to conduct the landing itself. And all we're going to do is observe because it's like 11 minutes to send a message and 11 minutes to get a message back. And so it takes, you know, like 20, 25 minutes just to get a round trip uh, signal. So they can't control it. All of this, boys and girls, to say as sincerely as I possibly can, learn to code. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be journalists. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a kind of an interesting um, uh, analogy between the, the landings we've made on Mars and the landings we made on the moon. Uh, the first moon landing went to the most boring place we could find in the Sea of Tranquility. It was perfectly flat. We didn't want to screw the pooch on the landing. As the Apollo missions became more uh, successful and as we gained more and more experience, we began to land in more and more difficult places until finally on Apollo 17, we land in the Taurus Litro Valley. We land in the middle of three mountains, huge mountains with the rills and all kinds of things. We did the easy stuff first and then we did the difficult stuff. But it's a different problem with Mars. And for those people who say, how could we have ever gone to the moon without computers? Well, we went with, to the moon with the top computer in the world, which is the computer that these guys had up here. But we couldn't do that on Mars. When we landed the Viking landers, which were gigantic, by the way, they weren't rovers, but these things were enormous, landed on Mars in 1976, put them in the two most boring places we could find. They took astonishing pictures, but unlike the moon landings, which have live pilots on board, all of the interesting stuff, like on the moon, is difficult to get to. Just a few years ago, in 2010, we had to land the Curiosity rover, and we did it with that same sky crane maneuver, but Curiosity had to land someplace relatively safe. But this time was different. This time, we wanted to put it in the center of this crater because it was a clearly an ancient floodplain, and to get close enough, we had to land this thing in very difficult terrain. And Perseverance has done something that has never been done before, and that's simply this. Perseverance carried with it its own digital Neil Armstrong on board. There's no way to get information from Earth, but this probe, for the first time ever, when that heat shield came off, it looked down with radar and with optical sensors and figured out where it was. It knew where it was, and it flew itself to a very small flat area and landed itself absolutely perfectly because this time we had the computer technology to be able to do that. Whether or not Perseverance is going to find life on Mars, I think, is, is practically academic after the magnitude of this achievement. Uh, in 1976, with the Viking landers, they scooped up some dirt, put it into a, a, a experiment that was designed specifically to look for life and what appeared to be organic signatures came back, but they said, no, that's probably a false positive. Well, they took a look at that data 25, 30, 40 years after that. And they said, no, there probably is. That was probably an organic reaction. It may not have been life, but it was almost certainly an organic reaction from our probe in 1976. 
Perseverance is going to do what it's going to do, and it's going to find what it's going to find. For those of you who are sure that that China owns the future and so on, just a few weeks before uh, Perseverance landed, China put its first probe into orbit around Mars. That is not an easy thing to do, but they put a they put a probe into orbit around Mars. And my fond hope is that that Chinese probe got to send there and send back images live as the Americans blew their doors off. And had hopefully <laughs> the people in mission control in China were sitting there with open mouths looking what these American kids at JPL had done and and once again put a, a, an exclamation point on space exploration since the end of the shuttle program. This image of this thing landing on Mars to me is is equaled only by, in terms of post-Apollo, equaled only by the image of those two boosters coming back and landing simultaneously on the Falcon Heavy launch. This is starting to get to be interesting again. And what they accomplished here was astonishing. The, the, the youth, the age of these people was extremely, extremely impressive and encouraging. And uh, life's starting to get interesting again, and we'll see what it finds. But my God, anything that accomplished something that difficult and managed to take a photograph of itself doing it, a video of itself doing it, that's a success before the mission even begins. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. We'll see you next week right here on Right Angle.